want to thank the organizers for organizing the session, giving me the opportunity to speak to her, here to you today. Um, the gradual advance of the Urnfield phenomenon has been discussed in detail, and various reasons for this has been offered. The spreading homogenization during this period is often attributed to increased homo uh, to increase connectivity and mobility. The reasons behind this, are, though, are hard to grasp. And recent tradition, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Traditional archaeological techniques have reached the limits in doing so, but due to recent advances in chemical and biochemical analysis, we can now rely on a list of different techniques in ascertaining mobility and connectivity. But sadly, the outcomes are rarely sufficiently integrated. In the following talk, I want to give an overview of an interdisciplinary approach I use for assessing mobility and connectivity and the Lower Trison Valley in the cemetery of Inzersdorf for my PhD thesis. And by mobility and connectivity, I do not only mean the mobility of people, but also that of objects, that of ideas, that of beliefs, and also that of knowledge. On the individual level, but also on the level of communities. Um, just to give you a short overview of the cemetery I'm working on, it's situated in the Lower Tyson Valley, close to the Danube confluence, and the construction of a motorway there demanded huge amounts of travel, with which resulted in large-scale rescue excavation and led the Tyson Valley to become one of the best archaeologically investigated areas in Austria. You can see all the sites that have been uncovered. Um, the Heritage Department conducted excavations there. Here are just a few impressions on that. And Yeah, the cemetery contained 273 graves, which is the largest early Unfit cemetery in the eastern Austria we have, including 21 graves with more than one individual. The graves are either long rectangular, we are considered these to be the oldest graves, or round to irregular, which are considered the younger graves. Uh, most of the graves contained urn burials. And, but some scattered cremation graves were also recorded. Large parts of the center and the rims were removed during gravel extractions, in case you wondered of the strange shape of the cemetery. And in the southwestern area, it is overlaid by a cemetery of the Latin period. As I said, the cemetery is situated close to the Thais and Danube confluence where the Danube provides a powerful west-east axis and the Dreisen supplies access to the alpine foothills with the natural resources there. And given the location and the assessment of the grave goods, a number of different kinds of mobility can be expected, like long-term seasonal migration, residence change upon marriage, travel, trade, or just social visits. And when you consider that, there are some questions that arise, like where do foreign influences come from? How strong are they compared to one another? How well is situated uh, is Inzersdorf situated compared to other cemeteries? Which kinds of mobility can be detected? How can they be linked to certain identities? And what does this tell us about the communities? And how does the geographical setting influence connectivity and mobility there? And how to answer that question? There are a few techniques I rely on. And well, ascribing a uh, specific material culture to a specific ethnic, ethnic group is definitely outdated today and definitely what I mean when I say I search for foreign goods. When I search for foreign goods, I basically mean goods which should not usually occur within the context of the specific material culture of the specific site. This is a technique that is solely based on, a, on the artifacts. And so it relates to the finds only. However, objects do not move without the help of people. It's just not necessary that the people the objects were found with that were responsible for moving them. They might not even be really foreign. They might be locally made. And even the idea of the object traveled. This is an approach that has been used frequently in previous times, but has been neglected in recent, in recent years due to the upcoming of more modern techniques. But I would argue that there's still a lot of value to be found there, especially if complemented by other techniques. 
The basis for this is a well-defined local range of material culture, which is why I am at this point re-evaluating the urn fill culture in the region of the Lower Trisen Valley. Here on the upper map, you can see all the urn first sites that have been uncovered there. Um, culturally, the cemetery has been attributed to the Bayerdorf Velas, this group, spreading in eastern Austria, western Hungary, western Slovakia, and southern Moravia. And Inzersdorf is situated, situated at the westernmost edges of this area. So the only really foreign goods I'm going to be able to find, or I'm finding at the moment, are western goods, because in the eastern area of this whole cultural complex, there's just the same mm -hmm. stuff there to be found. On the individual level, a social status analysis provides the means of interlinking um, different kinds of mobility with the uh, social stratification represented in the cemetery, if we presume that the cremation mode and the burial mode represents the social status of a person. While I was working on this, I realized that, while I was working on the cultural chronological, but also on the social status analysis, I realized that a detailed insight is hard to get due to the poor preservation of many findings caused by the fire during cremation, the phenomenal processes while being interred, or the rough method of excavation. And furthermore, that the, the distinction between those differences is hard to get than it first seems. But exactly the differences burned on a fire, only placed in a grave, or a dual function could give us insights in how a person was perceived and how the cremation ritual developed and changed over time, and therefore give us a chance to understand the underlying societies better. Therefore, I started a series of experimental cremations in 2018 to see which conditions and how they alter specific artifacts and see if we can link specific alterations to specific utilizations during the rituals. So as for the level of communities, thank you for explaining network analysis already so I don't have to do this. Um, although I use it a little differently. For me, it provides the means of exploring interaction, but not necessarily movement as such. For me, it provides the means of assessing the degree of interaction by connecting nodes from, in my case, cemeteries through various attributes, in my case, cemetery structure, grave structure, grave ritual, and grave goods, and expressing them in statistical terms. Um, so far, the computed network shows only a very patchy and biased picture. This is why I put it so small in the upper left corner, so you, don't so you can't see it too good, because at the moment it tells us nearly nothing. Because here you can see all on this map are all the cemeteries I've taken into consideration, and then the following maps there are all in yellow are all the cemeteries where some kind of data is missing. So, and if you would cancel all these out, there would only be in stuff left. So. Mm -hmm. There's, at the moment, a very huge bias towards Inzestorf, but this is mostly due to the size and the data I have. Chemically <coughs> assessing the provenance and the character characteristics of artifacts gives us additional data that can be juxtaposed with the archaeological results and refine the interpretation of these artifacts. As for the bronze artifacts, trace element analysis main purpose is chemical composition. It is showing is shown as the chemical composition of the artifacts. And the foundation here for is the assumption that artifacts made from the same ore deposit uh, share a chemical composition of trace elements. And even if we cannot match the the artifacts to a specific uh, ore deposit, we may be able to identify workshops or units of production such as artifacts made from the same mixed sources. Second lead isotope analysis main purpose is origin determination, 
based on mainly the same reasons, it is thought that um, artifacts at, made from a or deposit shared uh, the same lead isotope ratio. However, you have to be aware that ratios may strongly vary within an ore deposit and that um, some deposits may share the same ratios. Sadly, for the lower Tyson Valley, there is no comparable data available at the moment, but we have a good grasp on the Tyrolean and Mitterberg region and on the Slovakian region, and an ongoing study will hopefully give insight on the Eastern Alpine Samarin region. Additionally, the, the analysis of the stone material can give us more insight about raw material preparation. And the uh, found sealants in the stone <coughs> seem to have been obtained from the south of Moravian region. Combining the results of these analysis, this work will answer questions on where the raw material ca came from and how and will reveal to which degree metal circulation <laughs> raw material preparation was important as a trigger of travel in general and, and how this impacted the, the community or communities. Whereas the described techniques primarily tackle objects as proxies, new biochemical approaches give us the means of targeting human mobility itself and therefore rely to migration. Since we are working with cremated remains, as we all know, we don't have to deal with genetics, but strontium isotope analysis has been successfully applied for years now, and more or less recent research has shown that cremated remains have some advantages over non-cremated remains when it comes to strontium isotope analysis. Um, because we can measure every bone we want to. And since the human bone remodels during lifetime, it is thought to reflect the final years of one's life. However, it has been pointed out that the different bones vary in the time it takes them to remodel, and therefore we can draw conclusions about which age of, at uh, which age uh, most of the migration had happened by juxtaposing different kinds of, uh, different Strontium isotope ratios measured from different parts of the body. Mm -hmm. And since the results relate directly to migration, they can highlight gender, age, and status relate to migration patterns. And can tell us whether some objects move together with people or not, indicating migrated people or travel or trade or just other forms of distribution. So far we have analyzed 120 samples out of 104 individuals and mathematically only two outliers could be identified. So that suggests more, but, but here we have to await the still ongoing environmental sampling. We did this together with Christoph Nick and his team. Um, <coughs> yeah, but the, the, one of the outliers I wanted to show you is from grave 29 of my cemetery because it's, um, it's actually this outlier here and it was a juvenile individual which was associated together with a bronze casting mold which might indica indicate metal related travel, metal related migration, maybe some form of knowledge transfer, maybe some form of apprenticeship. Um, all by themselves, these methods provide only a very restricted insight and a very narrow view on mobility and connectivity. And they all have their restrictions and advantages. On Thursday, Colin Renfrew raised the question whether we see different kinds of mobility, large-scale migration in the early and the advance of the Bronze Age, and and, and travel and trade in evolved Bronze Age? I would say no, or we don't know at this point. It's simply a question about which methods have been applied. Because for the early Bronze Ages and for the late Neolithics, lots of strands and isotope data and genetic data exist. And for the later Bronze Age, major, uh, much uh, metal analysis has been done. But with the strands and isotopes and with uh, uh, with uh, genetics, you're never going to be able to target <coughs> trade, and with the with the 
with the meta analysis, you're never going to be able to pinpoint migration as such. With both of them, you're never going to be able to really target knowledge transfer and influence in short time travel. So, therefore, the point I really want to stress is here that we are also not really only interested in who went where, killed of all the men, mated with the women, and superimposed a new culture. Neither are we only interested in which stuff was brought where. What we are really interested in is how the dynamics of the society work, how interaction affects individuals and communities, and how in turn they affect interaction. Uh, in order to understand the resulting continuities and discontinuities better. And so therefore we have to compare, interrelate, and interweave different kinds of data to draw a more broad picture and what kind of what kind of mobility and connectivity and interaction took place. For my case to understand the cemetery of Insistoff better, but also the whole Burnfield phenomenon. Thank you. <laughs>